Good afternoon or good evening. This is Dan Brook uh, coming from Hudson, Wisconsin again on this uh, spring uh, late afternoon. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us again. We have identified ourselves as different voices, shared visions, predominantly because the three people uh, that we're going to be talking with again today uh, one comes from the Jewish tradition, one from the Muslim tradition, the other from the Christian tradition. And yet we have long ago come to realize we share the same planet, that our roots are uh, intertwined and uh, we have much more in common than we have the things that separate us. And it's a delight we've had over the, the years that we've been doing this and we're grateful for your presence with us again uh, today. Our topic today is just a little bit different than the kind of topics we've covered in the past. Uh, sort of the mentor of our program is a guy by the name of Dick Schager, and we were uh, honestly sort of giving him a bad time a little bit ago because he has suggested for the last six months or so that we do a pro program on Epiphany. And while for those of you who uh, may be Christian watching this, Epiphany has a special sort of a church season meaning, uh, we are going to use more of a generic or uh, sort of an original uh, meaning of the word Epiphany. Namely that it's uh, sort of a, a sudden flash of insight or understanding, uh, often precipitated by uh, just a common event that allows us to see something in a whole new way. Uh, the Greek word uh, for epiphany means to shine forth. It's like all of a sudden uh, we have a new understanding of a, of a concept or a context or it could be any number of things. Now I have to confess to you before we came on the air there was some discussion about uh, uh, trying to think of any epiphanies, you know, a sudden flash of insight in our lives that, that has uh, helped us to see the world in a new way and, and even find ourselves behaving in a new way. Uh, that was bad enough, but earlier today as I was talking to my wife, who is an educator, and I uh, was talking about uh, the concept of epiphany, uh, she said, well, you know, if I were on that uh, panel, I would, I would expect you to give an example of it. <laughs> and so I sat and thought, as my colleagues here have, about the kind of a epiphany that's actually been life-changing. And uh, so in order to take up a little bit of time to give these fine gentlemen a, a chance to think a little bit about what the conversation may be as we continue on, I will uh, be happy to tell you of a epiphany that I had quite a number of years ago. Incidentally, my wife reminded me also that educators call this a transformative learning experience. Uh, something in your life that makes you, <laughs> that you learn finally to see something in a different way and it really changes your life. Anyway, so I was uh, going on for a master's degree many years ago at Northern Illinois University. <clears throat> And I grew up in, in a small Iowa town. My father was a clergy. I lived in a parsonage. Uh, you know, everybody was not only Anglo-Saxon, but mostly Germanic, and everybody was pretty much the same. But uh, my father, having gone to the seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, and my mother at that time wanting to be close to him before they were married, had a job as a maid in a very wealthy uh, family in St. Louis and lived in the, uh, in the workers' quarters and, and shared a room with an uh, uh, African-American, a black uh, maid. And so she was always a good mother to us, uh, <clears throat> trying to remind us that the color of our skin had nothing at all to do with the character of us. And, and uh, we frequently would have uh, guest uh, missionary people, a uh, uh, black, come and stay with us in this little white town. And, and so I, I don't recall anything in my childhood that would lead me to uh, think differently about uh, the color of our skin and that sort of stuff. But here's the, where the epiphany comes. When I was in uh, this first uh, graduate school that I went to, in one of my classes, I had a, a black professor, first black professor in my experience. And uh, I'm embarrassed, I have to admit this, especially to a wider audience now, but I remember sitting in class 
and uh, trying to figure out where in the world this person came from. His name is Dr. Uh, Dennis Howard. If he happens to be watching it, please accept my apologies 50 years later, more than that. Um, because he was so well-spoken, he was so bright, and I thought, well, I wonder if he's from the West Indies, or maybe he grew up in, in Europe or someplace. It was sort of inconceivable to me that he could be an African-American. And the epiphany came to me when all of a sudden it dawned on me that in spite of what I thought was an attitude toward people uh, not uh, uh, <clears throat> condemned to, to racism or anything, that in fact, somehow in my experience up to that point, I, I had developed a, a, a racist attitude because it was, I was incapable of seeing somebody who was non-white uh, as being capable of being a university professor. So that was a, a, an epiphany that has, has stuck with me the rest of my life to be very careful about how I, uh, how I think I'm always pure of, of any uh, uh, deceit or anything in terms of how I view other people because these kinds of things sort of sneak up on you and you, you sort of need that kind of an, an aha moment to, uh, to recognize that um, you aren't always all that you, uh, you think you are. So I've always been grateful for that epiphany, even though now I feel my cheeks flush because I'm still embarrassed that I had to admit that I couldn't see that person as a person, but only as a black person. So with that confession this afternoon, let's let each of these find people, introduce themselves, and I tell you, let's see if they can all find a kind of an embarrassing epiphany too, okay? <laughs> Who wants to start with the introduction? Rob? I guess I'll start. <clears throat> My name is Rob Wertheimer. I'm a lawyer here in Hudson. Uh, this June will be 25 years. I've been practicing law. I uh, originally grew up in New York City. I am uh, Jewish. My mother is a survivor of the Holocaust. She, at Holocaust. She was a child at the time. She was a hidden child. She's still living out in New York. And um, I've been uh, in Hudson uh, since 1991 now. And as far as uh, epiphanies, I have, uh, rather than a personal one, I'll, I'll give you what I got <laughs> prepared as far as religion and Judaism, but I can also talk about a personal one. But as long as I have this ready to go, why don't we do that? There is a Yom Kippur epiphany, and Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement in the Jewish religion, where each year, uh, so basically, that uh, the Jewish people are given a chance to come closer to God. Uh, the ultra-religious people, uh, every day they'll say three prayers, an evening prayer, a morning prayer, and the afternoon prayer. And then on the Sabbath and every other holiday, there's a fourth prayer. Uh, and then every Yom Kippur, where you atone for your sins and have basically a repentance and a, uh, a cleansing of your sins, you're given a fifth prayer, which is called the Ni'ilah. And that corresponds to the fifth and highest dimension of the soul. And that happens every year, and it's called an epiphany moment. And according to uh, Sha'ola, this great 16th century sage, there is no higher experience for the Jew as when he acknowledges the oneness of God and his readiness to give his entire life to God. This is the moment when the spark and the flame come closest all year round. This is the most powerful moment of the year, and it's the moment you are the closest you can come to the essence of everything, to God. And that kind of I didn't realize was even out there, but that's some moment that we are given every year as Jews to, to come closer and to join the oneness of God. And I guess as far as my own personal epiphany, I would have to say in a non kind of religious manner, I had uh, serious gallbladder removal about four or five, about five and a half years ago. And it was a serious operation. It was almost an emergency. And I kind of just realized to kind of get my stuff together and to kind of not take for granted either the people around me, my family and uh, just how I was living my life. And that was really what you might call an aha moment for me to understand that uh, we all are given this limited time here on earth and to make the best of it and to really not take people and things for granted. So that was my personal moment. Thank you, Rob. Oscar? 
Thank you very much. I'm John Kellich, and I'm a marketing professor here at the University of Wisconsin River Falls. I'm originally from Turkey, was born there, raised in Germany, went back to Turkey again, finished school and started there at the university, and moved over to the United States, River Falls, right away, nine years ago. So here it's me. Having the experience being here for nine years uh, and encountering different uh, friends, colleagues from different religious uh, backgrounds. It's very exciting to me. And uh, there's, as you said, many moments for me that uh, helped me to realize uh, that uh, I should appreciate what I have and uh, actually appreciate uh, the diversity I'm living in because I believe that diversity makes uh, this country and our lives richer. So that given, Epiphany in Islam, I, I really, I did some research, uh, I'm an Islamic scholar, mm -hmm. so, but as far as I know, and uh, I may I not know everything, so that given mm -hmm. fact. Uh, in Quran, it says that uh, there's many ayats, there's many uh, ways you can uh, recognize and understand that there is a God, and we only have to look around and, and, and observe things from that perspective. Uh, and that's the reason why in Islam, individuals are really uh, encouraged to, to analyze, to do research, you know, to uh, grasp a better understanding of what life is and the reason of life. So um, in this regard, I don't think that there is a major, uh, how do you say it, an event that encourages epiphany like in Christianity or in, in, in uh, Judaism, uh, but it's more encouraged to think, to explore, and, 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 and try to better understand. Uh, there's, uh, let's say, from my personal perspective, I, I have one moment uh, I, I'd like to share, which really shaped who I am from the very beginning of my, um, of my life. I was a month short of turning 14, and uh, I lost my dad in, in Germany. So you're in Germany, there's you, your, your sister and your mom, and uh, you, we know from our child and uh, from my child that how attached uh, a young, to be a young man, let's say, uh, is to his dad. So you lose someone you rely on, you lose someone you can lean on, and you lose someone you, you think is going to be around forever. That, that's what it is. But uh, the realization is that you can't do anything about it. It's not just you're young, it's more about we as human beings can really do nothing about this mighty power that takes something away from you. It was very hard, very harsh. But I came to the realization at that age that uh, maybe for some, this, uh, this thought uh, may not be accepted, but uh, I don't have the power. We as human beings don't have the power, but there's an ultimate power that rules above everything. That was one way to submit to the Almighty. I mean, during my life as a youngster and young man and, grow, uh, and as an adult, we made some foolish things, but this, this ruled my life, I believe, to the very moment now. It, it, it's more, uh, there's a power, you are not having the ultimate power, so you have to submit yourself. Again, for many, this may not be acceptable, but that's how I feel about life. And uh, the other thing is that you are alone. Uh, and you shouldn't be relying on human beings because they can be taken away from you. So you're alone, you're on your, by yourself, and you have to do the best what is under your powers and then rely on him, the superpower. So that was uh, the epiphany uh, many years ago, 40 years ago almost, that uh, that shaped and is already uh, and still shaping my life, I believe, so. Thank you. Dean? Yeah, it's an interesting conversation, an interesting one. Um, my name is Dean Simpson, Lutheran pastor in a little village about 10 miles from Hudson here in the little town of Roberts. I've been there over 17 years now. Um, I've been thinking back about the, to the epiphanies that have shaped my life, and I can remember all the way back to uh, 
my middle school years at a church camp, sitting around the fire the last night, you know, and having this sort of realization somehow that God is real and that I should dedicate my life to God, uh, not knowing what in the world that would mean. Uh, it didn't have much immediate impact. In fact, a week after that camp experience, you wouldn't think I'd had such a moment at all. <laughs> uh, but I would have similar moments, you know, every once in a while, these little sort of religious moments. Uh, and when it finally kind of took hold of me and began to shape my, my behavior uh, and my plans for my future much more was uh, at the end of my uh, freshman year of college when uh, I, I had a sort of a similar religious moment, this time in the company of a bunch of other campus uh, or, or college kids in the company of a quite conservative Christian group called the Navigators. And I had a conversion experience, and I stood up at a little at a meeting and said I wanted to give my life to Christ and so on, and and it really changed my life. Now I have some things about that that I'm that I've become increasingly uncomfortable with over the years. It was a, a wonderful experience that really sort of made real for me for um, in, in a way that lasted the the sort of the presence of God impinging upon my very life and existence that the decisions I make day to day ought to be in some way answerable to this mystery we call God. And yet within the community in which this happened, uh, it, took on a, um, it took on a meaning and an interpretation shaped more by that community than by God you'd say, I would say now. And I've had to unlearn a lot of things that I thought I was, was part of that epiphany in that day. I, I, um, I mean, I, be, I became a very exclusivistic sort of Christian and only we were blessed by God in our little narrow circle and uh, people like the Jews of the world or the Muslims or actually even people like uh, Lutheran Christians and Catholic Christians would not be included in, my, in our definition of uh, those of us who are really uh, right with God through faith in Jesus. And uh, so I realize now how um, that was sort of more of a social and political agenda uh, of, the, of the group that I was a part of when I had this experience. And because of the powerful emotional content of that experience, I just sort of relied um, 100% on the, in, on, the, on the community to interpret that and tell me what that meant. And it was really, a, 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 it was one of those experiences like, I think like we've all had of kind of growing up and learning that we can't take life for granted and, and that this is there's something profoundly moving and uh, deep and uh, wondrous and mysterious about this life of ours and we should wake up to it and take it seriously um, uh, but but yet there would be many many more such moments through the years um, that would that would give a quite different interpretation or meaning to this whole thing. So, so I'm, I am both open to moments of, of epiphany and kind of become deeply suspicious of them because you can get carried away in the experience, the emotion of it, and um, sort of uh, go off the beam in all kinds of different ways. Um, um, I, I would assume, I hope, I pray that the, the epiphanies I've had since that are more of a corrective to that original exclusivistic judgmental epiphany um, have brought me more in, on, on track with a, a kind of a religious outlook that wants to uh, participate in peace and harmony with people of uh, divergent religious views. That's certainly where I am today, and I assume that that 
is of God, but that's not where I was in that, those first few epiphanies, you know. So epiphanies are kind of yes and no for me. And uh, because of their power, they need to be, we need to be suspicious of them as well as sort of open to them. And, but we need to think carefully about where they're leading us and what they might mean. I mean, th that's very interesting what you say. And I think uh, many religious groups are maybe uh, trapped by this view. I mean, in Islam, or I don't know about or in Islam, I know that some isolate themselves and think they're better Muslims than other Muslims, and they don't even talk about non-Muslims. So, uh, and that's a trap, as you say. And uh, I, I believe the only thing uh, that maybe prevent you from going to this trap is the sincerity to your, to, towards yourself and God, I believe, and say, I mean, you don't want to exclude anyone who really sincerely believes in God and, and tries to submit and, and fears from crossing the line, because crossing the line means excluding other human beings who are God's creatures, right? So uh, I think that's one aspect that would help us to, uh, to, to go into this trap, but it's, it's, I know religious groups in Turkey, they, they consider themselves something better than other Muslims. You know, and, and, and that's not, really not what we want to have. Yeah. Yeah. It uh, <clears throat> reminds me, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Dean, yeah. Yeah. because uh, hard as it is to believe, some social science researchers have actually spent some time trying to uh, determine uh, well, well let's, let me back up just a bit. If we sort of make a, a epiphany and intuition uh, synonymous, and for the most part they are synonymous, uh, and intuition is defined as any flash of insight, real or mistaken, <laughs> on which we base a truth and understand that you know, there are various sources of truth, ways we arrive at truth. We tend to be uh, empirical, scientific truth arrivers ourselves, but intuition has a long-standing reputation as a source of truth, too. And so when that's been studied, what has been found out is about what you said, that about half the time uh, it, 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 it is to some degree at least truthful and about half the time it's not. So you have to be fairly uh, careful in terms of how much you rely on intuition or epiphany for a life-changing event. Is that basically what you were? Yeah, that sounds, uh, I, 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 yeah. I love to have that sort of that social scientific um, uh, a, a, approval of, of uh, or, or, or stamp of approval, whatever we call it, on, on my experience, it, it sort of lights that up and, uh, and brings some perspective to it. Because um, in the moment, these flashes of insight seem so clear, so powerful, so divine. And then, you know, later you look back and think, well, wow, how could I have thought that after some further experiences that shift your perspective? And so humility is always... Uh, you know, one of the one of the greater virtues. We all ought to try to remember that. Yeah. There's one other thing. I don't mean to dominate here, so no, go Rob, right you can <laughs> you can bust it any time. Okay. Sure. There, there was a point. Uh, you know, one of the things we had talked about previous to this is trying to think of some precipitatory events that were instrumental, maybe, in giving us these flashes of insight or these epiphanies and. And uh, <clears throat> one of my daughters at a point in time when I was having some, some uh, conflict with uh, the church sent me the greatest card I think I've ever received. <clears throat> and it was a picture of a, uh, of a, uh, a brother or a monk uh, running down uh, the road with a flash of lightning about to strike him on his behind. <laughs> And I opened the card, and inside it said, people change most often, not because they see the light, but because they feel the heat. <laughs> <laughs> and that was an epiphany moment <laughs> for me over the years. So the question is, sometimes these epiphany moments are, uh, the light 
only follows after we feel the heat. Can you think of some examples in your own life where you've find, said, aha, but only because you were being squeezed in a situation where you had no choice, but finally to face up to reality you didn't want to face up to before? It sounds like that was really a good question. Uh, yes, well, yeah, was, uh, a very good question. We, we don't want to uh, trespass on one another. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, it was a few years, not too many, two or three years after that um, conversion experience of mine in college, and I became such a such a an ardent Christian witness on you know parade routes and beaches and public settings and handing out tracts and so sure that everybody need to follow the way that I had found and so on. I had some conflict with my parents over that, my sisters and my friends, but I kept on with the encouragement of the community I was part of. And then um, I began to get to know some Native Americans on our campus. And they were having some trouble and they were doing some public witness to some injustice. And I began to get to know them and learn from them uh, their history and learn about them. And suddenly I uh, found myself becoming very embarrassed about my, the, my Christian history, the tradition of which I w was a part. And I tried to repudiate that, and yet I found I, I really couldn't honestly make a great separation. It really was me and mine who had committed such atrocious sins uh, uh, against you know, Native American peoples, against Jewish peoples, against... Um, well, others, others as well. And uh, um, so you begin to feel the heat of that sort of embarrassment. How, how, how was I blind to this? How, how was I unaware of this? Uh, how have I become part of something that is so proud and arrogant and, and uh, um, almost, um, well, you know, self-assured, only to find out, my goodness, it's really a multicolored, checkered history. Um, why don't I know more? How did I miss this re really important part of the story? How did, I, how did I fail to be sort of humble and open to this? And uh, you, you feel the heat of, of that... Uh, what you think is so true and clear doesn't really fit the facts and you've got to back up and it's a painful sort of experience and a valuable one and, and it's its own kind of ep ep epiphany. Though it doesn't occur in that momentary emotional sense, it is, I think, much more lasting, um, the, the, the things that sort of humble us, as your, as your experience was, Dan, with the, uh, the racist mm -hmm. self-awareness and so on. And, uh, those are those are better moments of epiphany than mm -hmm. the ones that make us uh, proud and militant. <laughs> I kind of had that type of experience too. About oh eight years ago, I was going through a very getting divorced, and my work was suffering, and going through a very rough period, and kind of had lost my way spiritually also. And through the guidance of uh, some really good people in my life who cared about me, I was able to kind of rise above it. And I mean, get over the emotional and the uh, family part and turn my life around career-wise and just get everything back together. And it was a renewed uh, spirituality and a renewed, renewed type of way of looking at life. And so it really, there really was a lot of heat coming down, <laughs> as you would say. And it did take that, that forced heat, so to speak, to really turn myself around because I was not in a good place. And so through all that and through a new, a new really a new faith in, in God, I was able to, to actually turn myself around. So I don't know if there was one specific day where I just realized, hey, things are turning around, but it was a process. And like I said, through the help of some really good people who were helpful and cared, I was able to do that. So that was my personal type of feeling the heat and getting better. Just yesterday, today, I, I was just searching about today's topic and I happened to hit a, a web page called uh, Muslim Youth Musing. So I just got curious about it and uh, get, got into its homepage, what, what the page was for. There were 
high school students, most of them high school students, college students here in the United States, in Canada, English speaking. Mm -hmm. And they were writing articles, essays about how they feel, how they believe, how they live, and how they interact with non-Muslims and within the Muslim community. I realized that myself as a college professor, how little I do to, to educate myself in my religion and other aspects of life. And I was embarrassed to reading what they were capable of writing. And that was epiphany, epiphany for me this morning, actually, especially saying, hey, I need to do more about this. So uh, now I, f I feel really, really little in my personality as a professor compared to these high school kids. They're, according to me, they're, they're great. And they're, if they're able to write such things, they're great. Hmm. And I'm little, really. <laughs> yeah. So it, it just sounds yeah. to me, tell me if this is what the three of you were saying, that there are epiphanies and there are epiphanies. Yes. If you have an epiphany that in some way sort of is self-aggrandizing, yeah. sort of makes you feel better about yourself, look out. It may or may not be all that helpful. Yeah. If, on the other hand, <laughs> You have an epiphany that kind of demonstrates a, a, a character weakness or a kind of a bad attitude yep. or something yep. that, that sort of uh, puts you in a better uh, reality state about who and what we really are. Those kind of epiphanies have a longer lasting value yep. and are much more valuable than, than the, wow, isn't that great? <laughs> Sorry. Is that what we're sort of coming to agree yep. upon? Yep. 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 So kind of humbling ourselves a little yes, bit, realizing exactly. yeah. that they're, you know, just an acceptance as well. So, you know, I think of the the early epiphany that I first talked about. It sort of created separation between myself and others different from me and and us. Whereas the kind you're, we're talking about now mm -hmm. are epiphanies that somehow help us find common ground and bring us together, heal the differences mm -hmm. rather than accentuating the differences and. And um, that sounds more in line with what all of our great religious teachers have, have taught and laid down for us in the beginning. And uh, I well, like it. Well, you, you know, in, in some sense, uh, finally, I feel a little bit relieved about what we've been talking about today, other than just a sort of a self therapy <laughs> uh, section yeah. around a, a certain topic, because. Uh, one of the epiphanies I think we've all shared over the times we've been doing this together is, is just that, that uh, it's uh, even uh, a, a form of epiphany to learn the various things that we all share uh, in spite of the fact that we come from histories that separate us out, that divide us. And one of the great gifts of the many epiphanies I've often had just talking among the, uh, the four of us has been something that has been life enhancing rather, rather than life uh, detracting. Uh, We've had a recurring theme of talking about all the things our different backgrounds do have in common, like yeah. you yep. just said. Yes. I noticed that when you were saying that, we're coming back, like you said, we're coming back to our good theme here, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. which, which is good. I mean, we need to accentuate that. The, the commonalities as opposed to the differences. Well, is there anything else about epiphany or intuition or uh, that uh, basic uh, uh, concept that's worth uh, talking about before we uh, say goodbye to our uh, friends today? Uh, w one thought that occurs to me is um, no matter what kind of an epiphany you have, type A or type B, you know, <laughs> that we've identified here, or type C through Z, um, every epiphany probably is going to create some uh, tension as well with some group of people who don't like our epiphany. Okay. Um, uh, it would be nice to think that the, that, the, that the light that shines in our darkness and leads us into greater harmony would just result only in harmony, but there will be those we will face who will not want me to be hobnobbing with my Muslim brother, my Jewish brother, yeah. even my 
Lutheran brother, you know, or Missouri brother or whatever. And um, so that's not exactly an epiphany, but sort of a warning. Uh, epiphanies don't lead to uh, light and, you know, misty paths and rose-covered rose paths, but uh, deeper into the conflict that is this world. And, uh, I want to add a couple of things to what you said. Epiphanies, I mean, the definition is it happens, a sudden occurrence, sudden intuition. But mm -hmm. even though it happens suddenly caused by a trigger, I believe it needs a certain foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs a certain background. You at least have to think about that issue, whatever enlightens you. Uh, either you have to study it, you have to think about it, you have to observe really and have the curiosity and, and the focus or the persistence to do so, after, you know, to expect some positive epiphanies. That's how I feel about it. Otherwise, we're just sitting here. Believe me, nothing will happen. So it has to be some action. Exactly. You can't exactly. just be thinking about no. it in your room no. exactly. and, not, and not doing anything. Yeah. It's kind of like positive thinking. You yeah. can think as positive as you want, but if you don't follow through, then what happens? So it won't happen. Right. So it, it requires a focus, dedication, and some foundation knowledge. That's how I feel. Without knowledge, uh, it would be like more, uh, you would be overwhelmed and not being able to do what to do about it and think or assume that you're something special. And I think that's not the purpose of, of all this. Spoken like a scholar. <laughs> uh, I did? Okay. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, there is a woman. Uh, there is a woman from our church, and I was speaking with her not long ago. She's in her nineties, and um, according to her testimony, she has never had an, a moment of epiphany. She's never had a sort of a inbreaking of the divine or a moment of, of insight. And yet, I know of no human being um, who, who has been more giving, more faithful, more kind of the salt of the earth you know, than this woman uh, raised a farm woman and uh, raised a family and been a member of her community and contributed as much as you could ever think any saintly person ever would. And yet she's never had her, her own, at least that she can identify, her own moments of epiphany. So that ought to tell us something about uh, the, 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 the value of tradition and learning and yeah. growing up and yeah. apart from any epiphany as well. Uh, the thought that came to me, and maybe the two are related, <clears throat> is that learning, if we call an epiphany a, a moment of transformational learning, uh, learning always requires change. Yes. And change, uh, the nature of change is conflict on one level or another. So the question that came up in my mind is whether there's a relationship between how change-oriented we are and the amount of epiphanies we experience yeah, okay. because uh, from what you say, and it would sort of make theoretical sense, if, if we tend not to be open to change, why we're not going to be too open to these uh, moments around us that cause us to have a flash of insight or understanding. I thought you were going to say something a little different about that, Dan. I thought you might say, the less we expect ep 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 epiphany, the less we might experience it. Um, or that we might not even recognize it when it occurs, or just moments of learning or something. But in our area of, in our uh, age of rapid change, we, we might be just sort of more ready to, for these sudden insights, like it's some big deal or something. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if Maybe that's people what you're are waiting saying. for just that big aha that doesn't come. It comes in little moments. Yeah. Yes. Kind of like you're saying you might miss. Yeah. <laughs> and living the daily life and doing the right thing and helping others. She may be having a bunch of mini epiphanies without the actual big one. Yeah, or just one big long one or something. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, we are grateful that you were present with us today as we had a, a happy opportunity to talk about something we typically haven't talked about and maybe even thought all that much about, but our, I, I think all of us... Uh, We'll, we'll go away from here today thinking more about uh, uh, the type of epiphanies we have, how many we've had, what they have done to bring about change in our lives. And we hope it's been helpful to you too to uh, sit back and reflect a little bit on 
uh, the changes that take place in your life because of the experiences you have and how those experiences have offered you the opportunity to have new insights and understanding, especially uh, from our perspective with regard to how, along, how we get along with people, how accepting we are of other people, and, and that you might know of our encouragement to be uh, open to uh, learning to know as many different kinds of folks as you can and finding common ground and knowing that that's an epiphany in itself in terms of uh, helping us to uh, accept uh, and affirm one another. Toward that end, uh, we offer our thanks again for your presence with us, and we hope you'll uh, tune in to us again next time. Thank you so much for coming.